So today's talk um, is, especially compared to um, some of the other talks in the last couple of weeks, this is a very light talk. This is um, com um, comparatively elementary. There will be a little bit of working with H, um, with higher inductive types, and there will be, most of the rest will be kind of fairly elementary playing with complex variables, playing with um, elementary complex algebra. Um, and there will be not much, not much that goes too deep in any direction really in this talk. It's sort of a fun, fairly light interlude. Um, so it's in a way uh, um, a story that I'll be only giving the beginning of. It's kind of a thread that um, uh, I started a couple of years ago um, after Overvolfach, after we'd come up with the idea of higher inductive types. Um, and worked on a bit with, um, discussing with Mike Shulman, discussing with Chris Kapolkin, and then sort of let it slumber for a while, and then Guillaume took it back up and nicely finished the job more recently. So he'll be telling you about, um, he'll be kind of telling the whole story and taking it on in further directions next week. Um, but for this week, I'll give a slightly different angle, not going on in the type theory, um, but again, coming back down to the classical um, complex variables constructions. And so this was just after we'd come up with um, higher inductive types, trying to say, OK, so as a kind of proof of concept, what are the first kind of non-trivial things we can do with them? Make sure that they really are, that they really do give some of the non-trivial things that we should expect to find coming up um, from classical low dimensional topology coming up in these. And so one of the first things was um, Mike getting the proof through that pi 1 of s1 was z. And another one, as we said, well, classical object of low dimensional topology that's describable in terms of spheres, cells, and fairly straightforward ways is the Hopf vibration. So we should be able to replicate that in our language. So for those of you who aren't familiar with it, what is the Hopf vibration? Um, so first, Entirely classically, um, if you look up Wikipedia and um, go to the Hopf vibration, what will you see? Or when, when you take out the kind of pros and the fluff, what do you see? Well, you can see half a dozen different things. There are quite a few presentations of the Hopf vibration. The key thing that's, um, the main key thing that's common to all of them is that it's a vibration, and in fact, moreover, a fiber bundle. So a particularly nice vibration. A fiber bundle. Um, with base, the two-sphere. So it's a vibration over the two-sphere. And its total space is a three-sphere. And even better than that, it's, fi it's fiber. So It's fiber over any point is the, um, the one sphere, the circle. So base S2, total space S3, and fiber. And since it's connected, the fiber over any point is the same. Um, So I mean, that's kind of neat. That's kind of cute, um, straight off the bat. But how does it fit together? Um, so what, what actually is this vibration? One definition is, so there are several definitions, and they each fit. Each of the definitions kind of generalizes nicely in different sorts of directions. Um, there are a whole lot of nice um, directions of the hop vibration generalized in. In particular, for instance, there's a family of other hop vibrations that it's called of, but this is a sort of standard member, um, one that one thinks of as the, and I won't discuss the others for today. But um, one of the definitions one can take using complex numbers, using the complex representation of um, S3, so we take S3 as 
um, pairs of complex numbers such, uh, such that the squares of their magnitudes equals 1. And so this, in a way, we're really not using much of the complex structure in this definition. The magnitude of a, the square of the magnitude of a complex number is the sum of the squares of its components. So in terms of just this description, we can e um, this is pretty much just saying pairs of four points from the reals um, whose squares sum to one. And so that's certainly one representation of the three-sphere. But the reason we want to put it um, complexly is so that we can then tie it into the base And we'll represent the two-sphere as the Riemann sphere, so the complex numbers together with a point of infini at infinity. So um, I'm going to slightly change this definition in a moment. So don't um, set in ink just yet. So we could simply say S2 is the extended complex numbers, the Riemann sphere, complex numbers with a point at infinity. Actually, for the sake of what we'll do later, let's set it up a little more symmetrically as um, mutually inverse pairs from the extended complex plane. So this just makes it a bit clearer how it's symmetric um, in inverting Z and W. And so now, um, sorry? Um, yes, yes. Zero, zero times infinity being one for the purposes of this. Yep. Oh, I'm sorry. C. C hat. Um, sorry, extended. Um, Um, I don't mind what notation I use for this so long as you'll allow me to write this. Yep, absolutely. Um, any consensus on what's the preferred notation for the Riemann sphere? Yes. <laughs> so I don't. So I, do, I don't mind what we call this. I want to be. I want to use the coordinates z and w like this. So I feel. Um, so certainly this is a map um, with um, total space S three base space S two. Let's convince ourselves for a moment that it really does have um, fiber S one. Oh, I'm so sorry. I started writing that. <laughs> and then, yes, um, that's quite important for saying what the fiber should be. So the map is given um, any u and v like this, we take their ratio one way around and symmetrically the other way around. So, um, so the z and w for this representation we represent in terms of u and v. And we'll be, um, just in terms of this kind of way of specifying the map, we'll be later on coming back to a lot of um, sort of small spaces represented as um, subsets of the complex plane in this, these kind of ways, and representing a lot of maps between them by going between named coordinate representations in this sort of style. <laughs> yep, yes. So using the naivest and crudest um, things that one could do with one infinity in this. And in this, we're, we're not, we're not e um, even beginning to go near the places where that would break down or go horribly wrong. We could, we could write out the half dozen special cases that we need. For, but, um, so, yeah. so this is the, um, one of the classical constructions of the hot vibration. And let's quickly check the, um, that the fiber is S1, given um, 
ZW is ZW equals 1, um, we want place of UV such that U squared plus V squared equals 1 and U of V equals Z. For, the, for, um, for this purpose, since the Z and W are mutually defined, we can, um, the W condition is equivalent to this condition, so we can forget it for a moment. Um, but let's see. So this is equivalent to um, pairs Um, uh, sorry, this is equivalent to just V such that um, ZV squared plus V squared equals 1. Um, and simply substitute out for U. This, but this is now equivalent to um, 1 plus I need to Z squared all times V squared equals 1. This is equivalent to saying that the magnitude of V equals um, 1 of the root of Z squared and so we can now say yes this is um, isomorphic to the circle, except, do, 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 hang on, um, we should have um, been careful because this was, this step we were naughty, we did what every undergraduate is told they can't do, and we um, implicitly in this isomorphism were not careful about whether we were dividing or multiplying by zero or infinity. So, as long as, um, Um, and so this works as long as, um, which way around, as long as Z is not infinity or equivalently V is not zero, this works. So if Z is not infinity, then all of this works. If Z equals infinity, then switch to W and do the, um, do the same thing the other way around with W. So um, either way around, we have this argument that works if Z is finite. The other argument switching U and V works if W is finite. Um, so in any case, the fiber comes out to be S1. And um, if you have an eye on the fact, uh, the question of kind of how far um, one should expect vibrations to trivialize, it should be no surprise that we had to, in some sense, um, split up between W and Z and get an argument which was not continuous over the whole sphere. If we'd, if we'd got through to this stage without having to stop and say, oh, hang on, check by cases at some point, then we would have come very close to constructing an uh, isomorphism of the fiber with S1, which is continuous in the base, and so trivializing the, trivializing the vibration, which we don't want to. So um, this is so this is um, kind of quick classical review of what the hot vibration looks like. Um, any any questions looking at that before I move on to what happens when you come at it from higher inductive types? Good question. Because it's there is one thing. Um, because it's, um, it ends up being very helpful for understanding the relationships between spheres and hence between homotopy groups, and in particular between homotopy groups of spheres, but in general relationships between spheres and homotopy groups. Also, I mean, various geometric phenomena come up and one can get them analyzed through this. I don't...
So this, so this comes in in that this gives a map from S3 to S2, which gives a non-trivial element of, H, of pi 3 of S2. And it takes a little work, but not too much to get that from this. Um, I, I wish that I could try to draw a picture of it. I don't think I really can draw a picture. There are, there are nice pictures on Wikipedia and elsewhere on the web which have things like sequences of interlocked key rings and those kinds of things, um, but I won't try and draw one now. If, if anyone can suggest a, something to draw. One way. Yeah. I think that that's certainly that is certainly one of the pictures one can aim for. Again, it's beyond my blackboard skills, I'm afraid. But yeah. Um, so yes. Yeah, so this is um, classically the the hot vibration as one might quickly see it. What happens if we say, OK, let's come at this from higher inductive types. We've just defined higher inductive types. How can we try and build the hop vibration? Well, all right, so let's quickly um, remind ourselves what, um, what are the relevant higher inductive types. We have S1 is generated by base 1 is in S1 and then Loop one is a path from base one to itself. Um, where's the chalk gun? So S2 is the same, except that the loop is a two cell. So we have kind of base point. And loop two is a path from REFL, um, an identity path on base two to itself. S3 um, we won't end up looking at as a higher inductive type um, in this talk. So I won't give that for now. But when Guillaume takes the story further, then absolutely it'll be He'll be looking at a version of S3 as a higher inductive type too. So um, we want a vibration over S2 with S1 as fiber. Let's see, so what, what kind of thing are we even trying to write in the type theory? Um, that's, we're trying to write a map from S2 to type. Um, so um, a map from S2 to type is exactly an instance of where we can bring out the elimination property for the higher inductive type mapping out of an inductive type. So and so it's given by um, the fiber over the base, which in this case is, well, we know what we want the fiber to be over any fixed point. We want it to be S1. Great. And then. Um, we want that the action on two cells of hop applied to this loop it 
should be um, should be something of the sort. Um, what, what type should it take? It should be a path between refl s one and itself in paths in the in the universe from S1 to S1. Right, so generally, um, so generally, a map from S2 into any type X is equivalent to uh, um, an element of X to be used as the image of base, and then a path from refl x to refl x um, inside paths from x to x inside the type big X. So to, to, to map from the sphere into any type, you need to give a base point and then a two loop, a two cell in the type between refl of it and itself. And so in this case, the type that we're eliminating into is the universe, or a universe of types. Um, and so we give an actual type as the fiber over the base point. And then we give a two cell in the universe. And what is a two cell in the universe? Well, at this point, if we don't make um, an assumption something like univalence, we're stuck. Because we don't, um, in just plain old type theory, know anything about what the paths in the universe are. But under univalence, we know very nicely what they are. So, um, so assuming univalence, um, we have that uh, we know that S one e equals uh, the qualities between S1 and S1 in type are equivalent to um, are equivalent to equivalences from S1 to itself. And so, so what we want as a second part of the um, eliminator here is a path um, so we're looking for a path in equivalences from S1 to itself. And what's it going between? Well, it goes, um, its source and target are both whatever the reflexivity corresponds to under this equivalence. And that's exactly the identity equivalence. So. So the identity equivalence, which let's call it for now um, little id. So we want a um, path and equivalences from there to there. But now again, this is all equivalent to the firstly, paths between two equivalences in the space of equivalences are the same as paths between them in the, path in the space of functions because um, Equivalences, being an equivalence is just a property of a function. Um, so the inclusion of equivalences into functions doesn't change what the paths are. Another way of looking at that, uh, that is to say that if you've got two equivalences and a homotopy between them as functions, that then every point on the homotopy is again an equivalence, because each point on it is homotopic to an equivalence, so it's an equivalence. And so it's a, that's a path between them in the space of equivalences. So, um, this again is equivalent to paths in the space of functions um, between these things. And paths between functions, by functional extensionality, that's the same as pointwise equalities or homotopies, which we're using as uh, double equals, I think, uh, in the library last time we looked. So let's write it by a long equals for now. Um, so, so what we need to give 
for the second part of here, a homotopy from um, the identity on the circle to itself. And generally, this would happen whether we'd started with a circle or any other space. We didn't do anything in particular with the circle in here. Generally, a uh, fi uh, vibration over the two-sphere corresponds to a choice of the fiber, over the, um, and then a homotopy from the identity on that fiber to itself. Um, so, I mean, we, we could say a loop in this space. I, I mean, it's, it certainly is a loop. Um, Yep. Yep. Or even just in the space of functions. Um, and certainly there's, there's a good tradition of uh, writing this. Um, I don't know. On the one hand, I don't know. Some, uh, some, some mornings I would feel like writing this to distinguish the fact that it's um, auto equivalence or something. Other times, it's nice to, nice to keep it like this just to emphasize the fact that this is simply uh, um, an instance of a more general notion. I mean, the philosophy that there's nothing special about groups compared to groupoids. Um, one can... Um, or even, but even if we were, we could see it as being from the general groupoid structure on equivalences, rather than specifically from the group structure on auto equivalences. So, that's a, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I don't have strong feelings one way or the other. Yeah. We can call it either. Um, but the point was that a vibration on the two sphere consists of sides. Yeah. It doesn't work. So generally, yeah. 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 or in slightly more elementary terms, uh, a homotopy from id x to itself, since this <coughs> is... In more elementary terms, it's a proof that id x is simply a space. Um, yes. So that's, that's slightly more elementary terms to stay, but this is the one which is 
typically more elementary to give because this, so this Hamtoffy is saying for every, um, for every element of x, a path in x from that point to itself. By functional extensionality, they're absolutely the same thing. All of these are the same thing. So we're also giving one way to look at it is a natural loop um, at any point of x, a natural loop over x. An ele yep, um, yep. So in particular, we're, for the hop vibration, we're trying to give one of these things for the circle. And so, um, just looking geometrically for the moment, we want, uh, let's draw a picture and convince ourselves of what we want. We want a homotopy from id s1 to, shouldn't switch notations, um, the identity on s1 to itself. So what can we do? What, what's, a, what's a natural homotopy from the identity on s1 to itself? You've got the identity on s1 is sitting there. You want to move it around somehow in such a way that after you move it around, You've still got the identity. Every point's the same place as it started. Can you just not move it? You could certainly just move it. And that's always an option. That's something that for, um, that's kind of the most natu um, natural and straightforward thing one can do. We could do that for any type x. There's always an inhabitant here, the reflexivity type. And so that's something nice. It's something we can always do. But what it gives us in the end is that that gives us the, um, trivial vibration whose total space will just be equivalent to S2 cross X. So that's a g certainly something we can do. But in this case, we, want, we need something which is going to end up non-trivial and specific to the fact this was a circle. So that's, I think, the simplest thing we can do. But it's not quite enough to give us something, give us what we want. So Dan's um, setting about saying, Ch exactly, we can take the circle. And we can spin it. Um, we can spin the steering wheel once. Um, we can say, at time zero, it's sitting there like this. As time goes round, we spin it like this. And then after a spin, we've come back to where we started. So that gives a homotopy from the identity to itself. And notice we could also um, have chosen to spin twice, or spin five times, or spin minus 17 times, or whatever. But spin once is a fairly natural place to start. And spinning zero times would be your suggestion. Um, so intuitively, it's clear, what, um, it's clear that there's, there's a very natural choice of non-trivial um, homotopy here. So, Yes, we could spin backwards once, just as well. Um, if we, um, well, we've already broken the asymmetry by choosing our loop here. So if we hadn't broken symmetry somehow, there were, then we'd have to do so here. But we already have in this case. So. Yep. I don't know. When we've so when we chase through that to see how that comes out as this, then let's return to that. And quite possible. Hmm. Good question. Let's come back to that. Yep. Um, so there's one clear non-trivial um, natural um, Natural candidate. So, um, so, yep. Um, it, this is probably a good moment. Um, it's so the paths are symmetric in the sense that there's an isomorphism between paths going one way and paths going the other. Um, so in the, in the same sense that in higher groupoids, 
an arrow in the groupoid, it does have an orientation. On the other hand, it's equivalent to an arrow with the opposite orientation. Yes. So oriented in the same sense that many presentations of higher groupoids are oriented. Yes. But the um, Yes, I'm right. Absolutely. So I mean, so I mean, I've yes. I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, I'm not. I'm not saying this is directly what I would type into cock. This is, this is. There are. If if we if we want to type this into cock, then or agda or whatever, there are several points here where my one line would become five lines. And also, saying from spin once, from spin once, we have to unwind this description of spin once using the elimination property of the circle to get an element of that type. And I'll go in that direction in a moment. Um, I wouldn't say the trivial choice is not good. It just it doesn't give the hot vibration. It gives a different vibration. Yep. I mean, it it gives a perfect it gives a good vibration over here. It just doesn't give the hot vibration. So. Yep. 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 Yes. Um. So. So, yep. so as, as Vladimir said, we've, um, saying spin once isn't um, enough to really check that we actually can define this in the type theory. And if you're going down the type theoretic road for, um, further, what you'd do would be say, well, we're trying to produce something of this sort with x equals s1. So we break down using the universal property of s1 and show that we can create something which, is, um, which implements our uh, our geometric picture of spin once. But I'm actually not going to go any further down that road. Um, what I want to do is chase back and say, and just do a, um, a sort of plausibility argument of why this now, I, I said to Eve that if we chose the constant homotopy, that would give the wrong total space for the vibration. OK, well, why does this give the right total space for the vibration? Um, why, does, why does this homotopy correspond to the right thing to give that classical vibration we wrote down earlier. And so I want to um, chase back to the classical world and see how um, this correspondence of what vibrations over the two-sphere are, see how that classical correspondence arises in the um, classical setting, and um, see concretely what it's implemented as, and then see why um, under that correspondence that we've explicitly constructed, this vibration does indeed correspond to the spin once homotopy on the circle. So, in other words, you want so. to show that the uh, vibration constructed this way is the up vibration in the model. 
So, yeah, so it won't, it, I won't formally show that, but it will at least give a plausibility argument for that. Um, it's, so since the topological model has many, um, many difficulties and I'm going to work topologically, so what I say and work with won't, as, um, at least not in any way that I know of, be a, an actual formal model for higher inductive types, but it'll be a plausibility argument um, for, um, for the way that higher inductive types should interpret something like this um, and how uh, under a correspondence that looks like a plausible interpretation of this, the spin once homotopy will correspond to the hot vibration. So, so, so the to do next is persuade ourselves that this corresponds classically to the hot vibration. So, So we want an explicit correspondence in the topological world between um, um, vibrations over um, S2 with a given fiber X um, and um, homotopy is from let's move now to a more traditional notation homotopy is from the identity on X to itself And this is, not surprisingly, this isn't something which, we, this correspondence isn't something which we were the first people to ever think of. There are, um, it appears in various guises in, um, under various names in various different areas of the literature. I haven't actually been able to find a kind of single clear statement of exactly this lines um, that with, with some clear name attached to it. But there are a lot of principles that are similar to this that imply this, that have it go back and forwards. So, 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 what was the title, sorry? So, um, yes, I don't know the literature well, so there are, I, I absolutely, when I say I haven't found anywhere with this exact statement, that's certainly not saying it isn't there. Um, this is one place it could be. Uh, um, other analogous statements um, or analogous um, places where this sort of principle comes up are um, in, with vector bundles, um, they're described in several places in terms of clutching functions, um, and that's essentially exactly this in the linear algebra world. Um, 
and uh, another um, essentially so if one was constructing vector bundles instead of fibrations or fiber bundles um, then this would be this homotopy would become a loop in the um, SL sorry not SL um, GL of the vector space that was used as a fiber um, yep. yep. Um, and yes, and another um, version is that um, is state. Um, this can be unwound from statements of the form, which um, that fi um, vibrations over. X with fiber F in some sense of that um, is equivalent in some sense to class of maps from X into the classifying space of the topological monoid of autoequivalences of F. And this is actually one of the um, closest things I've, um, that I know of in um, kind of classical approaches to algebraic topology to a very univalency type statement, saying that vibrations are equivalent to maps into some space of type, since one can see the uh, B of ORT of F as a universe of types that are equivalent to F. So this is. So st these are sort of classical functions that um, imply the versions of these imply uh, correspondence of this sort. Um, but let's actually, um, I said this talk wasn't going to go too deep in any direction um, and getting into these would go count as going reasonably deep, I think. And I'm going to be much more naive, much more um, explicit, and just write down decompositions of spheres and concretely work out how um, we can go between things of this sort. So and, um, and one can check, of course, not surprisingly, um, that if one um, takes certainly any of these, and presumably that, and unwinds it, um, beta reduces it down to something concrete, one gets what we're about to give. So, um, so we'll, we're going to unwind this very concretely. Um, So let's um, look at the, the sphere itself, S2. And we can see the sphere as it's got a northern hemisphere and a southern hemisphere, and they intersect in the equator. So the northern hemisphere in itself, when, when we delete the southern hemisphere, just look at the northern, the northern hemisphere itself is just a circular disk, a two-dimensional disk. So it's a D2, which let's call it D2N for the northern hemisphere. D2 south for the southern hemisphere. And the intersection um, is a copy of S1. So this square is a pullback. And it's also a push out, because we can see the sphere is the things glued that way. Um, and let's, so we won't follow this that far, but it'll be helpful for a little while. Let's put a base point in as well. So we're thinking of the whole thing as a base space. Um, since we're thinking of vibrations with a given fiber, 
if a thing of vibrations with a given fiber, um, to make sense of that, we want to mean what we want to mean by with fiber x is to say there's a base point here. These are vibrations together with over the base point that fiber being isomorphic or equivalent to x. So, uh, so that's a sphere. And suppose you've got a vibration over it. So um, I would really like the diagram that we're about to draw here to be above that diagram there. And it will be in a moment when I put the blackboards back, but I'm not quite tall enough to draw it up there. So um, suppose you've got some vibration E living over the two sphere. Then certainly for a start, we can um, pull it back to its restriction over either of the hemispheres. Actually, let's leave a little more space on the left. And its restriction over the equator. This will certainly always be a pullback. Um, and under reasonable hypotheses on the space involved in the vibration, it will often also be a push out. So certainly, if this is a fiber bundle, uh, um, that will be, again be a push out. And indeed, um, were in the case of the hot vibration that we'll get to, we will have every nice hypothesis we could possibly eat. So in that case, it's a push out. But generally, it might or might not be a push out. But, it'll often, um, but under reasonable hypotheses, it will be. So we've got this. What can we do with it? Well, the nice thing here is that the disks are contractible. Oh, and let's, sorry, let's put our, um, let's put our fiber in there to start um, for a moment. So if you look at either of these vibrations over the disks, con um, the disks are contractible. And any vibration over a contractible um, space is equivalent fiber-wise to a trivial vibration. So let's see what we've got. Given, um, given E over S2, look at um, E restricted to the northern hemisphere over the, um, over the northern hemisphere. Um, since um, this is contractible, we can find um, a fiber-wise equivalence between this and um, the trivial vibration let's call this um, phi sub north oh yes thank you very much that's a that's a very good point um, trivial bundle maybe it would be a less ambiguous word for it um, Um. Yep, absolutely. Constant vibration is good if a thing of vibrations is mapped into somewhere. Yeah. Um, so trivializing E over D2N. So um, we have. So um, we have this five ways equivalence um, phi sub n with d2 across the fiber. And we can do the same thing, of course, on the southern side, exactly symmetric. Um, and let's see. And when we pull these, um, 
when we pull these back to further to the equator now, we'll get that this is isomorphic to the equator across that height. Not right, because it's very, very, very tempting to write this for a moment. But we have to be a bit careful, because certainly when we pull this back here, we'll get something which is S1 cross S, and this will pull back to a 5 wise equivalence with um, the other restriction of E over the equator. And certainly when we pull this back, we'll get, um, and now let's take this little, move that a little bit out of the way. Um, when we take this back, we get a copy of S1 cross F and an equivalence of it with E restricted to S1. But they may not be as the same. There's no way to know that we can't see from what we've got here that they're the same. And in fact, we don't want to, because this turns out to be the, um, the heart of our correspondence, the key to our correspondence, that we've trivialized our vibration in one way over one of the hemispheres and another way over the other hemispheres. And on the, on the equator, our two trivializations might not end up matching up. If they did, we'd be able to trivialize the whole thing, but they might not end up matching up. And so let's look at what we have got here. So we end up with, uh, when we, So comparing um, the trivializations over the equator, um, we have all living over S1, we have E restricted to S1, we have um, S1 cross F. And we've got this equivalence, which is coming from um, fine north, restricted to S1. Um, and then we've got another equivalence um, coming from phi south, restricted to S1. Um, so, um, So cutting out the middleman we ha and inverting one of these, since um, in the construction there was enough data that we, would, that we were able to construct if we wanted homotopy inverses to these, we have something which we'll call phi. So a fiber-wise equivalence between S1 cross F and itself over S1. And also, we can be um, just a little more. We had our base point here. Um, so, and we did know from the data in our diagram that each of these trivializations um, were chosen to commute with the base point. And so, at the base point, it does commute. So, um, so we've got a fiber-wise equivalence, but that's exactly saying for each point um, in S one, we get we've got an equivalence from F to itself, so the, from each point in S1 you have an equivalence between the fibers, so from F to itself, so let's call, um, call this um, total map um, phi hat, and 
over the, at the base point at time, at time one, let's say, um, we know that this commutes with those, and so there, it's the identity. So with so at, um, at time one, it's one f that this was these um, these all commuted with the base point. So we've got exactly. Um, a self homotopy of um, the identity on f so this is this is very far from being a proper correspondence in any careful statement of the sort um, between these things we took um, something over here we took a vibration with that right fiber and we constructed a self homotopy we didn't check and we won't um, that it's well defined up for any reasonable notion of equivalence um, we didn't check how the inverse goes, but one can chase those through, and those all do, do go through. Um, one can say good things along those lines um, in all sorts of ways. Just as an example of the kind of thing, one of the places where we made what seemed like an arbitrary choice was the trivializations um, over the north and ha south hemispheres. But again, by contractibility, those trivializations are well-defined um, up to fiber-wise homotopy. So they're not uniquely canonical, but they are canonical up to fiberwise homotopy. And if we'd pulled those fiberwise homotopies through, they would have um, told us that we got two cho chosen homotopies, which were themselves homotopic at the higher level. So um, up to homotopy, what we got here wouldn't have changed. And each of the places where we made some kind of arbitrary choice, one can say something like that. Um, but we've unwound, um, so we've unwound a kind of underlying um, um, map um, which underlies one direction of this correspondence. So this gives one direction of the desired correspondence. And what I want to do um, now, rather than checking that it really does lift to a full nice correspondence, is to simply say, so if we started with the hop vibration here, what do we get? We know what we hope we'll get. We hope to get the spin once homotopy. Do we really get it? Maybe, actually, maybe just, um, just before going back, it's worth saying a very quick word about how the other direction of the correspondence would go. That um, if we're given um, if we were given this, um, f the phi or equivalently phi hat to start with, then um, we would have kind of everything, the outer part of this diagram and not the inner part. But now this, um, this corner was essentially equivalent to that outer corner. And we said that under nice conditions, the total space E could be re recovered as a push out of its restrictions to the three different parts of the sphere. And so if we have, instead of exactly these, we have this kind of three-step um, span here. Again, we can take its push out, and that gives us a vibration over the whole sphere. And that is how, from a map of this sort, we can recover a vibration over the sphere, which then, when one goes back, will give back the map we wanted. So the other direction of the correspondence is taking push out, taking two copies of F cross the disk and gluing them together along the boundary of the disk according to the equivalence, according to the loop of equivalence that we've specified here. Um, so, so that's how the other direction would go. But now if we take this direction and see what it gives when we start with the hot vibration as we had it earlier. And let's, uh, let's for a little bit um, turn it um, this way so that we can just coordinate Quantify first of all our sphere. Um. 
So we have um, putting a sphere, a sphere well in the middle. As a sphere itself, we are representing that as pair Z and W from C infinity, you may call it that, um, such that ZW equals 1, mutually inverse pairs from the Riemann sphere. Then, see so hat, right. I'm not familiar with that notation for it, and I keep reading it and thinking pre sheaves. So, if I accidentally call these pre sheaves now at some point, uh, my apologies. So, uh, the two sphere, um, hemispheres now correspond to the unit disks in Z and in W. So, um, this is. Let's give it a bit more space. Um, so this is Z such that the absolute value of Z is less than or equal to 1. And we map in there by setting, taking W to be 1 over Z. So here's a convention which is going to go all through the big diagram that we're going to be um, constructing, which is that any parameter whose type is not given is a complex parameter, a plain complex parameter. So, um, and over this side we have the unit disk in W. And we go along here by setting Z is 1 over W. And their intersection we could describe. Um, I shouldn't anywhere. This is Z times W, sorry. Straight bit of chalk. Thank you. Um, and now for their intersection, um, we want the unit circle. What representation of the unit circle should we use? I'll use a. Um, I'll again have a parameter of a different type, and take the. So just for the sake of, again trying to be a bit more symmetric in W and Z, let's use a completely different parameter. Call it T for the circle. And so on this side, we take the unit circle ready in by setting z is e to the t. And then on this side, we want to set, so we need to end up with um, z and w being mutually inverse. So we set w is e to the minus t to give the embedding from here into here. Um, yes, I do. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. That's good. Um, yes, otherwise it would have given not quite the unit circle. So, um, once again, I guess I should swap these boards to parallel those boards. Once again, I'd like to be drawing all this diagram above all of that. But um, there's, again, I'm certainly not quite tall enough when we're writing a lot of different um, complex things to parameterize different bits of the hot vibration. So uh, the hot vibration, again, we, st we took by um, parameterizing the three sphere as pairs of complex coordinates, um, u and v, um, whose magnitudes together summed of squared to 1. So. Um, There's u and v. They're complex, so not, let's not even bother saying what they are. Um, whose magnitudes sum to 1. And then the map from here down to there goes by setting um, z is u over v, w is v over u. So then on the left, when we pull this back to the left side, we have, um, we get everything in here such that it's Z, it has magnitude less than one. So this is U and V is such that um, magnitude of U squared plus the magnitude of V squared is one, and the magnitude of U over V 
is at most one. And let's work just on the left-hand side for a bit and do a bit of work over there and then simply say, well, the right-hand side will be the same. So we'll work just on the left-hand side for a little bit. So, how, so we've got this on the left, and we want to trivialize it. We want to show that it's isomorphic to, um, the, um, to the unit disk there cross with the circle. How can we see that? Well, first we can write this um, as, gee, let's, let's do um, this calculation on the side for a moment so that we can bring it back without the intermediate steps to clutter the diagram a bit less. So um, we have pairs u and v whose squares sum to 1 and such so the magnitude of u of v is less than 1. So now we can rewrite this with this thing being called z. And since we're, we aren't in the case where this could have been infinity, we know it's um, small as the mon, so it's a genuine honest complex number. So this is, from z and v together, we can certainly recover u. Um, so this is pairs z and v is such that zv um, squared plus v squared equals 1. And z is smaller than 1. This, this is going into the right direction, because we've got one of our parameters now to be something coming from the unit disk. Um, we now just want to wrap this other parameter into being from the, from the circle. So we can factor this out a bit and get that this is, again, 1 plus z squared v squared is 1. Um, Similarly, this can be written as that the magnitude of v is um, root of 1 over 1 plus z squared. And so this is, um, so we can rewrite this as, this is equivalent to saying that we've got some, um, that the magnitude of alpha is 1, where alpha is um, the root of 1 plus c squared all times v. And similarly, v is alpha over that root. And so this space is isomorphic to pairs um, Z alpha, so by, by this correspondence between V's and alphas, this space is isomorphic to pair Z alpha, where Z is in the unit disk and alpha lies on the unit circle. So this is exactly uh, a trivialization of the form that we want. Um, we moved it, and we should be careful to check that um, the notation kind of took care of it for us. We want the trivialization, um, the isomorphism between this and Z alpha We want to know that um, this, res this was over the disk that we were, that we were working vibrantly over. Um, but that's taken care of by our notation. We've, whenever we're reusing a parameter here, like z up here and z in the disk, then implicitly the maps are acting as the identity on that parameter. And so and that from here down to the z gives the same as here into the z and then fix the z. Sorry? I, I suspect one probably can, I, yes, one probably can, yeah, something like, yeah. Um, yeah um, so, um, so we just, let's keep track of our formulas because we'll need them again in a moment. We had that um, here, Z was, well, we've already got, we already know that Z is U over V. Um, here we had that alpha was, um, 
root of 1 plus z squared times v and v, um, v and going this way, uh, then v is alpha over the root of 1 plus z squared, and then u was equal to v times z. So that gives us our trivialization, and um, on this side, we can do the symmetric thing. So this is uv set to their squares. Um, R1 and V over U is smaller than 1. And then this is isomorphic to W beta, um, where what did we have? We want something symmetric to that. Oh, so we start um, W is in the unit disk and beta is on the unit circle. And the relationship was that W, that beta should be um, root of 1 plus W squared times U. Um, U should be beta over this square root. And then V should be UW. So now we pull them into the middle. Um, and over, um, sorry. On here we have uv such that u squared plus v squared equals 1. And when we take their quotient either way around, we get modulus 1. So equivalently, we can say that they have the same magnitude. When we pull this back, we get exactly um, z alpha such that um, they both have magnitude 1, except let's reprogrammatize z in terms of t just like we did in the base. So this is t alpha um, such that um, where t was in R of Z and alpha was on the unit circle. And you have that isomorphism given by the same formulas as across there. And in this um, case, we have T in R of Z and beta, where beta's on the unit circle. So we've got the whole picture in place now. So we want to see how it corresponds to a homotopy. Um, so we can put these big diagrams living over each other as they should. And does anyone mind if I um, erase this board now for the homotopy? So um, So um, so what we have now is S1 cross S1, S1 cross S1, all over S1, where this is a little bit um, uh, confusing to read because of the fact that the different S1s are coming from different kinds of things. Um, this one, this second one, is from the fiber. These ones are all from the base. These ones are all essentially the same one, and we're always using the first projection. So in this picture, what's that come out to? We've got um, T alpha and T beta. all over just the coordinate t. And so we want to um, unwind this um, to um, map from S1 to automorphisms of F 
in other words, for each t, we want to see how the map relates alphas and betas. So, um, given t, how does alpha map to beta? And now it's just formula chasing. Um, we have that um, given um, given t um, if we say what we want to say what's beta in terms of alpha so we start up at the defini definition here on the right and chase kind of around the circle and come back to alpha on the left so beta we can give in terms of w and u so beta is root 1 plus w squared u. Unwinding that, let's see, w we know is e to the minus 2 pi i t. But that, oh, we don't even know, need to know too hard that it's e to the minus 2 pi i t. We simply need to know that its magnitude is 1. We're on the unit circle. Um, So this is root 2 times u. What was u here? Um, u was beta over um, the root of that. Um, so. Wait, that's wrong. Yes. No, um, yes. Which is the? Sorry. Which is the? Sorry. Yes, I know. No, actually, I'm going. Um, U is easy. Um, no, this is if. Um, Um, yeah. Um, so you, I guess, we know what. Um, how do we do? Um, Sorry, I'm, ha I'm having blackboard syndrome, so help is very gratefully, uh, very, very welcome indeed. Um, I, I have notes for this part somewhere on my computer, but we, sh we shouldn't need them. It is certainly chasing around the circle. Well, one of you see it before I pull them up on my computer. Yep, absolutely. So you read the next line off that I was about to come back with from the commuter. So u is v times z. And now here, z we know what it is in terms of t. And v we know what it is in terms of things involving alpha. So, so this is root 2. So. Um, and z was, what was z again? e to the 2 pi i t. Right. Um, so we have root 2 alpha over root 2 e to the 2 pi i t. So beta is e to the 2 pi i t alpha. And so this is exactly the homotopy we wanted. At t equals naught, this says that beta is exactly alpha. And then as t goes um, up through, this factor that we're rotating by goes around the circle and comes back to um, at t equals 1. Again, we have the identity. So this is exactly what we wanted 
confirming that, that indeed that the hot vibration under this correspondence does correspond to the spinning ones.